Okay, so we start the second talk of this track. So uh, this is Mark Swolonski, uh, University of Southampton. Um, so he's going to talk about processor intrusion detection. Um, so Mark is a professor at the University of Southampton, has written over 200 papers in the areas of EDA, reliability and test and three books. He's supervised over 30 PhD students to completion and his current research interests include hardware security, fault tolerance and behavioral modeling, modeling and simulation. So over to Mark. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll try and do it from here rather than sort of standing in front of the screen. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, one or two people have seen versions of this previously. So Duncan mentioned the um, Thames Valley IoT thing. So I presented a version of this a few months ago at that talk. So, but I, this has moved on a bit. And of course, what I'm presenting is not actually what I've been doing, but what my students have been doing. So uh, they do all the useful work. This cuts across um, several of the things that have been mentioned today. So um, it, it, yeah, security, there's, there's actually some stuff here about reliability and safety in there, which is where the, where the work came from. Um, I don't, I'm not actually going to talk about form verification as such, but some of this, again, the sort of fault injection ideas, go back to what Ian was talking about just after lunch. Um, and of course, it goes back to the IoT of things. So, so this is this is quite specific, going down to um, uh, quite detailed level. So, so um, some specific ideas. What I'm going to talk about is, is what we've been trying to do in terms of figuring out what's going on inside a processor under fault conditions. And we're fo uh, this is focusing on microprocessors or proce processor architectures because, of course, um, processors are at the heart of everything to do with. Internet of Things or, or anything else. The, you know, software sits on top of processes. If the processor fails, everything else is going to fail, or if the processor goes um, into anomalous behavior. So I want to give it a little bit of background. Um, I'll go through that very quickly and, and then say what, we, what I mean here by anomalous behavior and what we're trying to do about this. So of course, um, hardware is different to software in many respects because um, it exists in the real world. And, Basically, there's this problem of what are called side channel attacks, that people can do things to the hardware. Um, so if you want to attack a cryptographic system, why go and do a brute force uh, decryption attack? Go in the side channel, exploit the electrical effects, find out what's going on. That was my side channel attack into a, into a lock that, um, that's for some reason, the, the number on it got reset. And I thought, do I go through a thousand um, combinations or should you get a pair of pliers? It's a side channel attack. Um, so the point being that implementation is not the same as design. There, there are compromises, there's stuff to do with timing and, and so on. And of course, every device is unique and there is variability in there which can be used to your advantage, but that's another talk. What we were interested in and what we've been interested in is, is the idea of trying to detect uh, when a system is doing something that is unexpected. And the kind of hypothesis here is that embedded systems do predictable things, that they, they're not um, working, you know, they're not suddenly going to up, open up Firefox and, and, and uh, see what's going on, or they shouldn't. Um, but actually that hypothesis works at a higher level as well. I mean, if somebody's coming into a system, logging into the desktop machine, they're going to be using certain applications. If they suddenly start accessing a different server or start accessing a different application, that may, may be cause for concern. And there are systems around that have been um, developed and, and so on for doing um, anomaly, anomaly detection at a kind of network level. But what we're interested in is happening down, right down, as I say, at the, the very detailed hardware level. So is this started off in, in terms of reliability. So I say it sort of cuts across safety, security, uh, or safety and security. So what happens if you get bit flips? Now, again, the, the talk just after lunch, there was the, the fault model of, of um, bit flips was one of the things mentioned right at the end in the questions. This is exactly what we're looking at, we started looking at. It. What happens if a bit is flipped? But there is, and these may be one off, or, or they may be gradual things to do with aging effects. Again, that's a, a talk for another time. But the, what we've tried to do is develop this idea and look at and what happens if we have security things. So I'm going to say something about that at the end. And of course, how you react to that may be very different. So the, the hypothesis here is, is uh, and these are done from some simulations, um, and this is looking at built-in hardware performance counters that exist on, on a microprocessor core. This is an Intel core, and there are uh, something like, I, off the top of my head, something around 20 different hardware performance counters that are built into a core, and ARM cores have them and just as much. Um, and one of the hardware performance counters that, 
that is there is, is the committed instructions. Now, a lot of these hardware performance counters actually give you the same kind of information. If you look at committed instructions or you look at cash miss rates, the, the, the information you get is very, very similar in many respects. But you can see from this, I can see as a human being, that running one benchmark, which is not an IoT type benchmark, but it's just one particular thing, um, uh, a QSort program, there's a particular pattern of behavior. If we're running a, a different benchmark, there's a different pattern of behavior. They're very obvious, they're, they're, they're very different sorts of things. If you're running, this is not so clear, it may, it may be clearer um, uh, if everybody want, really wants to see this, I can send the slides out. This is using different data. So there you can see the sort of red marks here. There's, the patterns are slightly different, but they're still very similar. There's still clearly some kind of um, uh, pattern there that can be identified. But if we have a, an anomaly, whether it's a security anomaly or, or a reliability anomaly, we might, might well expect to see some kind of different pattern. So the program counter may have an unusual pattern. If somebody's trying to run a piece of software that is, is unexpected, the program counter is going to go out of range somewhere, perhaps. Or the cache miss rate may suddenly go up. Or indeed, in an analog sense, the temperature of the core may, may start to rise. And so the question was, can we model this? And, and what we did, or, or what my student did, was use um, an instruction set simulator, GEM5, which is fairly widely used by a lot of people, and model what's going on inside the processor core. We used an Intel core because um, uh, the a fault injection tool is, is uh, implemented for the Intel core, not for an ARM core, but that was, does, it really doesn't matter. And we generated a huge pile of data. So the, these simulation results come from running a Gen 5 simulation. And depending on the sampling rate that you use, um, as you can see there, 0.15 of a second took about 900 seconds of runtime and generated 7.5 gigabytes of data. That's quite a lot of data to play with. And um, we got a, a, a nice little award from Microsoft to use their cloud computing services, normally worth 20K, so thank you, Microsoft and what did all this in the cloud, running lots of simulations. Um, it was more actually just allowing this stuff to run and, and, and having the disk space to generate, to store all this data. And what, we tr uh, what my student tried to do was to try inserting bit flips into different registers in the processor core. And again, you can see from the different colors, I hope, um, that there is different, uh, different effects. So that you get different types of failure and I'll, I'll summarize this on, on the next slide. But you can see that same pattern is repeated, the same pattern that we, we had here uh, for that benchmark. But we get, depending when the fault is injected, and depending where the fault is injected, we get different types of behavior. So suddenly we get a crash, okay? Suddenly we get something going off and the, and the um, instruction uh, the, 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 the instruction commit rate changes. Or we get different things here, we get slight differences again, we, we get this is actually a, uh, a hang condition. And so the hypothesis is, can we detect this stuff on chip? Can we detect this behavior rather than waiting for a system to crash, or rather than waiting for something bad to happen, can we detect it on chip much faster? Now obviously this is starting to move into the realm of uh, machine learning and things like that. So, again, the question is, can we do that kind of machine learning on chip? Uh, before I go on to that, what, what I would mention perhaps is, is that there are, what we observed is four different types of behavior. And again, this sort of comes back to some of the earlier talks in that there are basically four types of behavior that we absorb, uh, observe depending upon where the fault was injected in the processor pipeline. So these are different stages. The greens are crashes. The program just crashed because of a bit flip. The yellow is a hang. In other words, the program went into a strange state and never executed properly. We get file, uh, silent violations, but we also get these blue ones, which are a large number of things, where nothing seems to happen. Now, actually, I don't quite believe that, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But one of the things that we have thought about, but um, maybe somebody from Synopsys or uh, one of these companies has a solution to this, is what we're doing here is injecting random faults and doing this by simulation. 
is, can this be done by some kind of formal method to work out the cones of influence, for example, to say, actually, if you're going to get bad behavior, this is where the, the faults need to be injected, and this is where faults won't have an effect, and maybe you don't need to worry about them. But as I say, I'll come back to these blue ones in a moment. So what we started to think about was, was how do we do the, the, the on-chip learning, um, self-monitoring, you know, can we, what is normal behavior, but then if a program goes into a hang state or crashes, or a processor goes into that state, how can it monitor itself? Okay, it's already in, in a bad state. Can we have an auxiliary processor? And that pretentious piece of Latin means who, who watches the watchman. So um, if, uh, if you have a, 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 an auxiliary processor, do you need to have another auxiliary processor to monitor the auxiliary processor? And, you know, that way lies madness. Uh, or do we sort of buddy the processes up because we have multi-core systems and can we, can we pair them up? Do we have some kind of distributed in, intelligence and is this actually scalable? So one of the things we're looking at is how we can do this, this monitoring. And so what we've looked at, uh, again, well, perhaps I should say one of my students has looked at, is, is looking at what we can do in terms of statistical methods to, um, to determine when, um, when we get strange behavior. Now, this is the cash misses rather than the committed instructions, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, this was just using a moving average. So in a, essentially what we're doing is looking at these patterns and saying, can we extrapolate for this from some kind of average? And um, you can see that the, old, the, the accuracy is not too great, 0.8. But it's a very, very simple calculation to do. It could almost be done in, in a sort of... Um, a little piece of hardware. Um, something slightly more, more uh, sophisticated, more complicated, is using an autoencoder. That gets an accuracy of 0.96. Um, there are a certain number of false negatives, in other words, um, things that are being missed. And again, it's a moot point as to whether, do you, do you want to minimize the false negatives? Um, this has quite a large number of false negatives, the things that you miss. Or do you want to minimize the false positives, the false alarms? Because as we all know, false alarms get irritating and at a certain point you switch off and don't pay attention to them any longer. So is it better to occasionally let something through if you don't get to 100% or is it better to just actually be cautious and say, hmm, interesting question. Um, I did, it, unfortunately I had to submit these slides a little while ago. If I had a bit more time, um, I would have, presented this data this, this slightly differently. This, this is um, this, uh, a false information on this. The, 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 the um, x-axis doesn't actually mean anything. What this is actually trying to show is um, how long it takes to detect something. And these are just 12 or so different instances. Uh, and the ordering isn't important. But what it's trying to show here is that the, um, the time taken, the number of cycles taken to uh, detect something is fairly constant, it's quite a large number, but the number of cycles that the processor may go through before it hangs, in this case for, for a particular benchmark, is in most cases higher than the time that it take, would take to detect the hang. In other words, what this is arguing, or trying to uh, appearing to demonstrate, is that if a processor goes into a hang state, there is sufficient time using these uh, analysis techniques to determine that the processor has gone into this strange state. Okay, as I say, this ordering isn't important. I could have done this as a monotonic increase. Okay, it doesn't matter. On the other hand, trying to detect a crash, well actually, uh, you may not be surprised to learn, sometimes the crash happens almost immediately. Okay, and you cannot detect it. Okay, by some other means. It just happens so fast that um, you can't get there. But in a lot of cases, okay, five minutes. Um, that, that we that there is sufficient time uh, to actually even even when the process is about to crash um, because the, the the error is kind of propagated through the, the pipeline you can still tell that something weird is happening um, the, the benchmarks are running loop in, in loops which again is why we've got some time if we're just running something straight through in a linear fashion so although if you can just about see this, this is the order of sort of millions of clock cycles, it's because the, the FFT function is going through a very, very large number of loops, and at some point it just wanders off and does something weird. What we've also tried to model is, is a software attack. Um, what happens in this case to the cache miss rate, when, when there is, and, and what this is modeling is a fault injection attack, sorry, a code injection attack. Um, and this is a, a benchmark running along 
uh, and this is from work in progress. Uh, a very regular pattern here. Again, to the human observer, you can see there's a kind of pattern here. It's not particularly regular, and, and there's a slight difference here, and this is actually due to the sampling resolution. There, there, are, some, there are some artifacts on this. But what this is showing is, is that this is what happens normally. This is doing the same thing, and about here, there is a, um, an error occurs. There is, there is a code injection attack. And the cache miss rate goes off into some weird, weird pattern. There's another attack some, that happens here. The, the thing recovers, and the second attack is tried. And again, something weird happens. So what we actually want to do is to look at the situation in, in, in some detail. And not so much worry about this as the software attacks. But what we want to look at is the situation that we get with these um, not manifesting things and say, actually, are there bit flips that could happen here that might disable security mechanisms, for example? So, for example, it, do you get something in the core which flips the bit that prevents execution of the stack? Okay, Because if an attacker in an IoT device could flip that bit, then buffer overflow attacks are suddenly back in business. Or potentially. Um, however, the tools that we've got to model this are not quite as good as they might be. We're relying on, on, a, on a fault injection thing. And the problem is that that bit flip ha has to happen in memory, not in the, um, not in the process of core. Uh, that's a philosophical question. Do we fail safe or fail secure? But maybe that's something to come back to. Um, single event reliability problems you can mitigate to some extent just by flushing the, flushing the pipeline and rerunning. Um, uh, a security problem, does, you need to do something different, you need to react. So, um, what we, what, as I say, to summarize, what we're trying to do is, is doing this on-chip monitoring. We started off looking at for reliability. Can we move into the realm of security and do this? Can we learn to distinguish normal behavior from abnormal behavior by looking at various hardware performance counters? And as I say, it's a deeper question, to what do we then do with it? Is there any alternative? This is a quote from a paper that was published two years ago um, of somebody injecting a, um, a Trojan a small circuit onto a chip and saying, um, can we use the sort of malware type detections? And their conclusion was, no, you can't. You have to look at um, looking for trusted circuits monitoring the execution of untrusted circuits. In other words, exactly what I'm talking about is defense thing. Because in some respects, you have no alternative because you don't know what the attacks are any longer. Um, and so finally, thank you to, to my two students who do all the work. Thank you. Any quick questions to ask? Um, there's a company in Cambridge called Metra, who probably is nowhere. We do exactly this as a product. Yeah, there, there are some other, um, uh, there are other people as well. Ultrasoft, for example, do sort of on chip monitors and, and things like that. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I know there are some people thinking in this area, but we're, we're, all, we're, we're trying to, as I say, cutting across several different things here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we have done some, done some mitigation stuff as well. The, 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 the thing, it was done on the SIS um, process really because of the, the fault injection tool that we had. Ideally, we'd like to repeat it, but it requires um, taking some, somebody else's code and reworking it, which is always painful. Okay, well, thank you very much for that.